Thank you so much, Suzanne. You know, I was sharing before we began the Zoom that I was texting with my uh, stepdaughter this morning, and I said, you know, you should come. This is gonna be a really great talk. And um, she texted me back and said, you know, I would love to, but I can't because we're having family drama. And I said, well, that is exactly what this intends to help hopefully alleviate just a little bit. So anyway, welcome to people I've met before. Welcome to people I don't know. I see Michelle, hello, and of course, Alex. And hi, it looks like Sally um, and Sammy. So it looks like we'll have some more people joining. But I'd like to just start with um, taking five to seven minutes in silence to ground before we'll have a little talk and then I'll do a guided meditation. We'll have some time for questions and then we'll close. So I'm gonna go ahead and ring the bell and we'll just sit for five to seven minutes. This part won't be guided, so you'll just be on your own to have a minute to soak in the silence.
was so delightfully amazing for me to observe in my own system what three to five to seven minutes of just quiet sitting can do to the body mind. Um, so welcome. I'm really happy to be here tonight. I'm happy to be with some of you I've seen before and to the new people. And I am pretty um, excited to talk about this topic tonight. In fact, I could notice while I was sitting just the tiny curdles of, of energy that were in my stomach and coming up into my throat in thinking about the topic. There's a chat here. Hold on, let me make sure no one needs. If you want to let people know. Oh, got it. Okay, so that was just a note to me from the facilitator here to let us know that we are being recorded tonight. So you can choose to stay off camera. You can turn on camera. If you have a question at the end, um, you will be recorded. So you can choose to leave your camera off if you don't want to be seen. Um, hopefully that's okay with everyone. And typically the way we'll use this is I, I may post it to you know some of my followers um, or SF Dharma Collective may use parts of it. So, okay. So I was just talking about um, noticing the, the, the curdle of excitement in my own system as I talk about this topic. Um, and I also noticed a few other things. I noticed how I feel connected to you all, even though we're in Zoom. And as we're closing our eyes and I'm just intending myself to be with you all, there's a sensation of awareness that comes over me that kind of connects us all together. And I always find that pretty remarkable that we can drop into space with each other, even in this sort of Zoom world we're all living in. So today, um, the intention of this talk is really to, um, to share ideas around how we can take the practice that we have um, that delivers us oftentimes so much calm and so much peace in our own system and move that into spaces where we have a tougher time. And certainly the holidays are one of them with things like everything from having to be around family to loneliness to financial stress to, oh my gosh, everything that's happening in the world right now. It's, it's just a thickening of time and a thickening of that stress. So there's a great anonymous quote that I'd like to start with, and it says, people are like hot water. You find out how strong they are when you put them in hot water, right? Or I think it was people are like tea bags. You find out how strong they are when you put them in hot water. That's what the quote was supposed to be. I think I typed it wrong here. But I love this concept of this, right? Like in our own practice, there's, there's sort of a, a classic tendency for most of us which is we sit down on the cushion and we can just feel that wash of presence, that wash of awareness kind of take over. And in some cases, I know in my earlier days, I felt like you know I was really just the a bodhisattva, the Buddha herself sitting in present time only to open my eyes, walk off the cushion and perhaps give someone the finger while I'm driving, right? This is very common, right? Where our biggest challenge sometimes is application. How do we take the teachings and how do we thread them through into our everyday life? And I, I know that most of you probably have had instances where this is felt like it can happen with ease and instances where it just gets pretty tough. And certainly the holidays are a tougher time. So how do we actively begin to practice this? It was Ram Das who famously said, if you think you're so enlightened, go spend a week with your family. And we all know that instant when we walk in and there's sort of that, that confluence of joy and excitement and dread for some of us, and sometimes even more dread for some of us, um, than we want. And I, I want to underline this a little bit because this is a time when things get pretty sensitive. And Noam and I, uh, Noam works for SF Dharma Collective, we're talking before um, we set up the Zoom call tonight. 
And one of the things I was sharing with him is I find it often so interesting to think about the physics of our family and the physics of meditation. And I lost my dad in 2007. It was a very sort of sudden um, loss. We didn't expect it at all. And the way that I kept describing it to friends is I said it was my first loss. It was the first parent that I lost and the first real big loss I'd had in my own life. And I kept describing it as, you know, it feels as if someone's like literally gone into my DNA and carved away a piece of me in both good ways and bad. And I think this is so true. We're actually, you know, raised in a way that our energy kind of fuses with our families. And we, you know, we break away and we individuate and we go out into the world and we start to kind of create our own energetic footprint for ourselves. And when I, when I say energetic footprint, I really mean the physics of like dots and air vibrating, right? Which is what we mostly are. And then suddenly we, we open the door and we return back into an energy field that can just light up our energy field and connect into us in a way that's kind of lodging itself into our being. And I find it very somatic. Um, and so part of the practice and part of what I'll be talking about and kind of pointing to tonight is how do we um, a notice when that happens, when that energetic fusing happens with our family and how do we manage to stay 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 in a state of present awareness with present time and this can can absolutely um, you know happen with our family members but it can also happen in our own loneliness or in financial stress right where we begin to take on energetic patterns for whatever reason that are no longer serving us and we have to really work to manage those energetic patterns I was listening to Tara Brock a couple of weeks ago and she was talking on this very same subject. I actually felt pretty pretty glad that I was sharing a subject that I developed that she also developed. I had to tell my ego to calm down. Um, but one of the things that she said is that when things get stressful, things get fast. And when things get stressful and fast, our wants and our desires are magnified, right? So, and, and when you pile on exhaustion or not sleeping because we're busy or not sleeping because we're stressed, it's even harder and harder for us to be present. So I wanna offer something that you may or may not have heard of. It's not something that's normally taught in sort of most of the Buddhist schools that I've um, attended, but it, there's something called the Four Chambered Heart. Um, and it's a book that you can buy. Uh, I, I will find the author and email it to whoever wants it. I think it's DeAngelis is her last name. But I thought that, um, you know, this was such a great way for me to bring to life how to check in with ourselves and stay present with our own heart when we're in times of stress, particularly around the holidays. So the first, there are actually four chambers of the heart and four different ways of talking about it. So the first one is full hearted. And I'm gonna go through and define each of these. So full-hearted, open-hearted, clear-hearted, and strong-hearted. So what does open-hearted mean? So actually, I'm gonna start with full-hearted. What does full-hearted mean? So when we're not full-hearted, so when we're approaching things sort of half-heartedly, there's an in inauthenticity to how we're showing up. So the question, the first question for us in any given situation would be, do we really want to be here? Do we really want to be where we are? And oftentimes there's not a choice. Sometimes if we're in loneliness, we can't really change our situation. Or if we have to show up to our family, certainly there are ways in which we could decide we didn't want to go home to family dinner. But there's also sort of all of those feelings that come along with you know the duality of do we want to be here don't we want to be here when it comes with our families the joy and the pain so this idea of full heartedness and do we want, really want to be here the first step to that is just dropping into the question itself so there doesn't have to be a doing in it but rather just an inquiry do i really want to be here and 
you may find that there are a number of answers that come up from that inquiry, right? Yes, I do. No, I don't. I sort of do. I sort of don't. And really the practice with asking the question of am I being here in a full hearted way is just to notice, just to notice what comes up. There's a question too in full heartedness around when is it okay to remove ourselves? So oftentimes there's this obligation, this obligatory sort of the sort of obligatory energy around the holidays, whether it's gift giving or how much money should I spend on something or should I attend or should I not attend a party? Should I go because of Omicron? Like there's all these questions right now that bring up obligation to some degree. And so in full heartedness, it's helpful sometimes to take an inquiry around, you know, how much, how, how will I be serving myself and the others that I'm being, feeling obligated to if I can't show up full heartedly? So the second chamber to the four chambered heart is open heartedness. So this idea of coming into any situation with a heart that's open to whatever it is we might have to learn. When our heart isn't open and it's closed, this is when we go into protecting energy or defensive energy, when we're starting to shut down. And what's so important about closed heartedness is the missed connection that we have. And this can be a missed connection with ourself if we're alone, or it can be a missed connection with someone else. So this idea of connectedness, can, and I say connect, radical connected, I know radicals over here, but radical connectedness. What does it mean for us to put the intention of connecting before anything else, before our own stories, before our own reasons, before our own defenses? Can we put connection first? So for example, even with politics, which is such a slippery slope today, and many families, including my very own, find ourselves in division and duality when it comes to politics. So when we think about open-heartedness, can we approach a conversation around politics with a connection first intention? And what would that feel like to the body? What would that feel like to the system? Disconnection closes down the heart. And when our heart is closed down, it's very, very challenging to meet any given situation, any tough situation, with, um, without pushing our own story or our own agenda into the environment that we're in. And so it's really a fascinating experience. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna talk about, tell a personal story in a little while about my relationship to my, my younger brother, in which um, you know, he is very much on, in a very different part of the spectrum than I am politically. And, um, and how, how that actually shifted when I made the decision to put connection over my own story. So the third chamber in the four-chambered heart is clear-hearted, clarity, clarity. So when we're not clear-hearted, we're walking in doubt, confusion, and ambivalence. And this can signal us to slow down and wait for clarity. And this is so, so, so important. Those of you who attended my class on the Angry Buddhist, we talked about slowing down slowing down our system, slowing down our mind, slowing down our reaction time, so that we can really get clear about where we are in any given situation, particularly with family. This slowing down and waiting for the heart to become clear before we make a conscious decision to engage. And the last chamber of the four-chambered heart is strong-hearted. And this is a little bit of a tricky one because the definition of strong-hearted in the book is the courage to speak our truth, which we wanna be able to do. We wanna be able to speak our truth. And the word courage is actually, actually, some of you probably know this, is derived from the French word, which is core, 
and the ability to stand by one's heart and stand by one's core. Now, why does it get tricky? It can get very confused with self-righteousness and it can get very conflated with our story. So, and then what that what ultimately then happens in that loop is we sometimes can slip into judgment, right? When we start to stand in opposition to anything, what happens is the, it, it gains power. So this concept of strong heartedness is, is, is tricky because we want to be able to stand in our own truth and to name what is our true core, but without any energy of pushing against, any energy of judgment. And I always say I defer back to the clear heartedness if I'm unsure if I'm in the right place or not with regard to how strong hearted so I'll repeat just the four chambers of the heart again. So full hearted. Am I coming into this with 100% commitment to being here? And if I'm not, just knowing that is enough. Am I coming into this open heartedly? What can I learn here? How can I grow? How can I find my own inner teacher in this moment? What can I learn if I just stay quiet? clear-heartedness, which is how do I go to stillness and slowness to find clarity in a moment? And strong-heartedness, how do I speak my truth and speak my core, but without slipping into my own self-righteousness, judgment, or my own story? Because when we get into story, talking against story, it's just point of view talking to point of view. There's no longer an authentic you, or typically an authentic them, in the conversation. It's just story up against story. So how do we move? How do we use and move through a four chambered heart and what can how, how can it benefit us? And there's a straight line from the four chamber, chambered heart into grace. And, you know, it's funny, I haven't talked about grace a whole lot in my teaching. So I did a fair amount of studying and preparing around grace. And I, I know each and every one of us, each and every one of you, has had a tremendous amount of grace in your life just to be able to show up to the practice. But in my studying around grace, I, I, I found um, just some very interesting teachings from my primary teacher, which is Adi Shanti, who's right here on my on my table um, around grace and grace he says when we believe what we think when we take our thinking to be reality we will suffer so this goes back to sort of the story and the and the and the strong heartedness is the strong heartedness coming from what you think or is the strong hearted heartedness coming from how you so I'll say that one more time. Is the strong heartedness coming from how you think? Or is the strong heartedness coming from how you how you be, how you how you're connecting to awareness, what's authentically arising in us? And there's something that some of you may have heard before called don't know mind. Don't know mind. And this is a, a teaching that actually comes from one of my teachers, Trudy Goodman where um, she was sitting for months and months with a Zen teacher in Thailand. And she kept asking him, you know, raising her hand and asking a lot of very, very intellectual, smart and spiritual questions because she's Trudy Goodman. This was when she was early in her practice. And her teacher had a very, very, very thick accent. And he would say, don't know mine, don't know mine, don't know mine, don't know mine. And it took her a, a good week or two to figure out that he was actually saying, don't know mind, don't know mind, don't know mind. So when we fall into not knowing, we open up the portals for grace. Grace can come in when we're shutting down all the energies of the brain that literally energetically block us from allowing grace to come through. 
Beyond even any teaching, though the aspect of spiritual life that is the most profound is the element of grace. Grace is something that comes to us when we somehow find ourselves completely available. When we become open-hearted and open-minded and are willing to entertain the possibility, this part is so important, that we may not know what we think we know. And this here is kind of the key. There's much more to this, this quote that I'm going to read to you. But this is such the key. In this gap of not knowing, in this suspension of any conclusion, a whole other element of life and reality can rush in. So we're opening up these portals for grace. So how do we make this real? So I said I was going to tell you a story about my little brother. So my, my little brother and I grew up in a pretty fractured family environment where I was his caretaker. He's about four and a half years younger than me, and he thinks he's about five and a half years older than me. And when, when we were little, um, you know, I was very much like constantly worried about him getting hurt or, you know, he was big into like building bombs and shooting guns. And I was constantly pulling, you know, finding, finding like white powdered bombs tucked in his bedroom and digging them out and bringing them to my parents. I mean, it was quite dramatic. And somewhere in his high school years, he had this tremendous shift as he was like going into college and i wasn't around him so much in those college years because i was away at college and he was away at college but he had this tremendous shift and he sort of came out the other side as a very conservative with very conservative political views um, he ended up getting married by the time he was 25 he had his first child by the time he was 26 he had three girls by the time he was 31 um, he walked the straight and narrow. He had a job. He bought a home in Danville, California. He did all the things that you would consider to be the right things by the book. I, on the other hand, just got married last year. I'm 55. Um, and I spent most of my life from punk rock shows in Los Angeles to being a punk rock show promoter to getting involved in Burning Man to working for Burning Man for four years to traveling the world to not getting married <laughs> not doing things by the book and there was at some point we switched and he sort of became he had this idea that you know he knew more than I did and he could um, like he, he was sort of you know by society standards he was doing things the way they should be done and we definitely started rubbing up against each other. I was very early in my spiritual practice and um, he would make a comment politically and I would inflame and I would respond and you know, complete disconnection would occur, right? Our hearts would close, our dinners would kind of shut down, candles were blown out and things would sort of escalate to such a point where I would leave and I would get in my car and I would drive home in tears every, every holiday. And as I practiced more and more, I wanted to run some experiments with my family. And so it was now he, my sister-in-law, my three nieces, all of whom now, the youngest one is 17, who are all conservatives. And I adore them, by the way, adore, adore my three nieces. And I just thought, you know, how can I stay connected with them still follow my own truth, right, my strong heart, but have open-heartedness, full-heartedness, and clear-heartedness when I'm with them. And so my experiment included the following. It included slowing down. It included not responding. And it included watching my own experience internally in the room and listening. And it sounds so, so easy. We hear this all the time. We need to listen more. We need to stop talking. We need to, but in the room with your family, when, as I said at the beginning of this talk, when our energies are starting to refuse, it is, it is a most challenging moment. And it took about six to seven years 
But here's what happened. And my husband's here, so he can kind of attest to this fact. What happened was my family began to experience me in a different way. And I, my, my intention with them was really when I walked in that room for the holidays, it was how, how, what will my inner teacher show me today? How will my inner teacher guide me today? And so I would get very still. I would go into a, a quality of meditation while I was at the dinner table or opening gifts. And my brother would push my buttons and he still does it to this day. He just pokes just to see, like, can I throw her off the cushion? And in, a, in many ways, it's like, you know, many of you have, I mean, all of you probably in this room have seen the big Tibetan Buddha paintings where the Buddha's sitting in the middle and he's surrounded by Mara, right? Mara were all the temptations and pains to pull Buddha away from awareness, right? That would pull him out of his meditative state, that would pull him out of presence. And I began to see my brother as Mara, right? Like he's just poking me at every turn to see if he can get me to react. And in some probably slightly twisted way, he kind of felt at home when I would react, right? Because it was the way we'd always been. But over the years, as I softened to myself, as I softened to my family, as I became still amidst my own suffering and amidst their suffering, because all we wanted to do really was connect, the whole family began to soften. And I'll even say at one point, just to give you a sense of how, how serious this was, I had been in India for, um, for four months and I came home and I had like a namaste necklace on, I think it was. And we were sitting at the dinner table and my brother turned to me and my nieces were pretty young at this point. And he said, we don't bring namaste into this house. We are Christians, right? I mean, it was, it was pretty serious. So fast forward to, you know, the last year or two. Now my sister-in-law is thinking about becoming a certified yoga teacher. And um, my brother, my brother actually just took my meditation, one of my meditation courses. So this is huge transformation. And I never, ever, ever said a word about my practice to my family. Not one. I didn't teach them. I didn't tell them what was happening for me. I didn't um, try to convince them of anything. I just showed up with my own presence. And miraculous things can happen. Right? It shifts the energetic resonance in the room. So how do we sort of take this idea right, of grace, love, and compassion and point it in the first direction that it should be pointed, which is ourselves? And this, my example of um, walking into my family home was really compassion first for myself. I probably wouldn't have called it that back then, but it really was because I was suffering. Every time I left that house in tears, I was suffering. Every time I, my heart wanted so much to connect to my brother and I couldn't, I was suffering. And so my first, when I look back, I think my first true heart's intention was, can I, can I soften things for myself, right? Can I be present to my every articulation in the room with my family? We have um, a lot of anxiety and fear right now. Like who's not anxious? Who, who feels great all the time these days? Everybody's raising their hand, right? Nope, I can't see you all, but I imagine it's a big fat no. So our family of origin gives us a lot of stress. Or when we have no family to be with. One in nine people were alone last holiday season. Now, part of this was because of the pandemic, I know, but think about that. One in nine people during this holiday season spend it alone. And so if that's you, how can you point grace, love, and compassion to your own heart? How can you be there in totality for yourself with your own sort of demonic narratives, right? Your own Mara, your own... Carrie's little brother, his name is Eric, if he ever joins, pretend I didn't tell you that. Um, and I wrote something I thought was kind of funny here, which is um, from tidings to abiding. 
But the funnier thing I wanted to share with you, and I, I hope that you'll find the, the joy in this, um, this idea here. But I had this idea of, you know, you know how people wear these onesies? Like during the holiday, people will put on these, or during the winter times, you put on these onesies and like you put your feet in them and like sometimes they're fleece and you can like put them all the way up and you can zip them and your arms are in it. So I came up with this concept for myself, which is like, I'm just going to put on the onesie of awareness. I'm going to like, whether you put on a physical, I shared this with some, a, a younger student recently. And he said, you know, I'm actually going to put on a real onesie when I go spend time in these difficult holiday situations. And so he took it quite literally. You don't have to take it literally, but figuratively, how can you climb into your onesie of awareness during the holiday season? Whether that's alone and you want to climb into the feeling of awareness or whether that's when you're entering your family dynamics. How can you, and so that's a little visual I'll give to you which is climbing into the onesie of awareness. If there are any great designers here, I would love to have some sort of a gif of somebody climbing into the onesie of awareness. Um, so climbing into that is a safe space, metaphorically speaking, right? When you go into the door, how can you immediately give yourself this cue? I love sort of cues for myself, whether it's looking at a tree or looking at a Buddha statue or looking at a glass of water as a way of dropping me into a state of presence. And so how can this concept of climbing into the onesie of awareness potentially serve you when you're with your family this holiday season? Okay. So some of you may have heard this story before, but there's a, a great story about the Buddha and as the story goes, um, the Buddha, you know, had been a, obviously a very holy man and he'd been traveling with his, his posse, his crew, to different cities and he would survive by begging for alms. And for those of you who aren't familiar with begging for alms, um, in the sort of very, very Buddhist tradition when monks take their sort of monk, monkdom, when they commit to being a monk, not sure what that's called. It's not precepts, because we all take our precepts as Buddhist practitioners, or we can. But when they take their vow to become a monk, um, one, of the, um, one of the exercises is to beg for alms. And this is where they actually go out with an empty rice bowl, usually in the morning. And they'll go through the streets with the rice bowl. Sometimes they'll, they, they used to knock I think door to door to door and people would put rice in their bowl and I think in other and other stories I've heard they just walk into the streets right and people come and put rice in the bowl and this is considered a very holy spiritual exchange with these monks right that you're sort of giving this gift of rice in return for not only their spiritual teaching but them holding the space of awareness so Buddha was being held very holy as he was, you know, beginning to teach and going throughout the land and teaching. And he came to a new town where nobody knew him. And he was in the street and a woman came up to him, yelling at him, saying, um, why are you begging? What, you look perfect, you look intelligent, you know, you're well-dressed. Like, why are you begging? Get out there and go to work. And the Buddha stayed quiet with his bowl. And again, she said, man, man, why are you here begging? Go out, take care of yourself. You look fully capable. And again, the Buddha stayed quiet with his bull. And the third time the woman was just irate and she was very close into his face and she was saying, hey, you, hey, you, get out there and work. You're lazy. What are you doing here? You're quite capable of feeding yourself. And finally, the Buddha spoke. Mother, he said with great humility, you've made me an offering, but I choose not to accept it. To whom does this offering really belong? By refusing to accept 
her offering. Who does the offering belong to? And this is so powerful when we think of returning home into family environments where maybe there's some energy that's stiff or stuck or hard or painful. And it's also really, really effective for those of us that are dealing with loneliness or being alone right now. And that the question is, when the offering comes, when the bell rings loudly in our face, do we have to take it? Can we just stand with our bowl and take the teaching, allow the teaching to come forward, allow the inner teacher to arise? So with that, we will drop into a guided meditation. And with this meditation, I thought it would be really interesting for us to move through the somatic sensation of the four chambered hearts. And those of you who've practiced with me and studied with me before, you know that um, one of my own uh, learnings as a student was the, the, the deep shift that happens when we pull the body and the somatic self into the meditative state. What does that mean? So oftentimes, many of us, myself included, when we, when we begin meditating, the meditation happens up here, right? And it's sort of a, a working to quiet the mind and there's a lot of sensation and energy in this region of the head. And oftentimes the first experiences of true presence and true awareness happens sort of where I would say here and out, right? So there's a way in which we kind of expand from our head out of our body. And I practice like this, oh my goodness, from about the year 1999 until 2015. So 16 years I was practicing from what would be called the head out. It's a very pra pra powerful practice in and of itself. But I, um, I asked a question of my teacher, Ajashanti, and I was struggling with anxiety and pain, a lot of it regarding my family. And I'll never forget one of the things he said to me is, you're a baby with a machine gun. And what he meant was, you know, you have the awareness, the machine gun was the awareness, right? But I hadn't learned how to pull it into my somatic self. And this is the key, because when we go into our family of origin or into sticky situations where we have to sit with the bull asking for alms, what we really are saying is that we're sitting deeply in a state of somatic awareness at the body level, that we can actually sense and feel awareness in our core, in our feet, in our hands, in our legs. And the trick to really doing application off the cushion is to be able to sense this in and around our body at any given time with our eyes wide open, right? So I can look at a chair, I can look at a cushion, I can look at a, at a, at a pen, and I can feel the sensation of awareness in all of these things as if these things are emulating and emanating awareness into me. And this is part of the practice. So with this guided meditation, we're gonna work with the four chambered heart and we're gonna work with it at the somatic level. Okay. So I'm gonna ring the bell. We'll close our eyes and I'll lead you through a guided meditation. That was not the ring, sorry. And we'll probably go for about hmm, maybe 20 minutes, 25, and then I may be quiet for the last several minutes and just allow us to sit together in silence. close. And 
I invite you, if you are able to sit in meditation, to sit and allow the belly to descend. Sorry, allow the belly to distend, which just means to release the muscles of the belly completely. This should give the spine some ease and allow you to sit up straight. And for those of you who are not regular meditators, if at all possible, if you can have your knees below your hips, so either that may mean that you're sitting on a, on a low cushion or even a higher cushion or a low chair, or even in a chair, you can either fold your hands one over the other, so not clasping because that will kind of trap the energy in your hands, but just hands one, in, one inside of the other gently in your lap, or you can have your hands on your knees. And just intending the chin down a bit, allowing the neck to straighten and allowing what they call in some Hindu practices, the shashumi, to run more easily up and down the spine. And begin first by connecting to your breath. And taking what may be the first deep conscious breath of the day. Allowing the eyebrows to soften, the eyelids and the eyelashes to release. the temples to drop down, the skin on the cheeks and the nose to relax and slack, the jaw to unwind, unhinge, the ears to let go, the hair on your head to let go. Your tongue to relax. Notice the skin on your lips. And invite that to let go. As if the whole head could gently float up off the spine like a balloon on a string. Begin to deepen the breath as you're inhaling down past your throat and into the back of your heart. And noticing your rib cage and your shoulder blades as they fold over the back of the ribs, allowing those shoulder blades to let go, allowing your wings to rest. And the next 
next inhale, traveling further down the back body to the lumbar spine. Imagining it as hot syrup. Releasing. Continuing with the next inhale down the back of the throat, past the wings, the back of the heart, past the lumbar spine, all the way past the glutes, the whole back leg, the back of the calves, just allowing the entire back body to let go. Back of the arms, the elbows, And on the next inhale, as if the whole back of the body could take a breath through every pore, imagining perhaps the pores themselves opening up and pulling in oxygen. coming into contact on the next breath with the front of the heart. Oh, heart, oh, weary, weary heart. And taking a breath and sending that energy right down into the heart space, the front of the heart, allowing the rib cage to open up solar plexus to part, the ribs on the side body to soften, to make room for the heart's potential. Breathing the next breath directly into the center of the heart. On your next inhale, breathing from the center of the heart down into the upper belly and then the lower belly, filling your whole body with the lightness of air. Allowing that air on the next breath to travel from the heart and the belly down the front legs, into the feet, the hands, On the next breath, imagining that your whole entire body is a balloon, like it's a giant skin balloon and you're breathing from the inside out. Whole body breath. And for the next three breaths, Just scan the body for any sticky spaces, any dark places, any areas that the breath needs to be intended into and invited into, and allow the breath to do the work of just letting go. If the mind wants to get involved, you can politely tell the mind your time now and come back to the body. And 
noticing the I am in the body. The I am with nothing more. Experiencing the what is. Awareness itself. Perhaps noticing the outside of the skin on your body as awareness itself. The skin saying, I am. I am. Awareness has a texture. There's a felt sense to it. When the mind slows and connects deeply, deeply into the resonant state of awareness. Awareness comes into contact with the skin, with the body, with the breath. And one I am. Perhaps you can notice even the hair on your body, the tiny hairs on your arms, the tiny hairs all over the skin, connecting to the field of awareness, as if a light is suddenly being plugged into a socket. it feels tingly or like a light static or a clear fuzziness around the whole of the body, the back body, the front body, the eyelashes, awareness, I am present, presence itself. Presence can be a verb or a noun, and in this case, a noun. Awareness. It can be felt as vibration. you're feeling it in the body, perhaps you're feeling it in the head, wherever it is, it's okay. Perhaps you're not quite sure if you feel it and that's okay too. But there's a palpableness to it. Perhaps even trying to focus on the back of the neck. Sometimes that's a great place to experience sensation of awareness, allowing it to pour over your shoulders, your arms, your body, your legs, as if being awakened from the trance of the mind. On the next breath, Breathing straight into the heart. And 
dropping in the phrase wholehearted. Just feeling from the heart. Wholehearted. Can I be here? And wholeheartedness. Can I bring my entire soul and being authentically here? And if the head and the mind want to get involved in the party, again, just kindly let the mind know, not now. And go back to the breath, back to the phrase, full-hearted. Back to the sensation in the body, wholehearted. And again, inhaling into the heart center, pulling in the phrase open hearted, noticing the shifts in the energy field, in the body, open-hearted, curious, connected, open. And noticing if there are any shifts in the body when we drop in open heartedness, what happens? Perhaps your shoulders back up, or perhaps even you close down a little from fear or protection. That's okay. Just noticing, not adding anything to the story. Next, inhaling into the heart, clear heartedness. How can I be and feel clear hearted? Clear on where I'm coming from, clear on where I be. of the four chambers, strong-heartedness, breathing in strong-heartedness, to know your core, to know your truth, without adding anything, without defensiveness, without judgment, without your story, where are you really? The you that has no story of you. That's the strong heart. Now imagining a four chambered heart in the center of your chest, taking a deep breath in full heart open-hearted, clear-hearted, strong-hearted. Full-hearted, open-hearted, clear-hearted, strong-hearted. Now imagining yourself in a tough holiday situation, whatever that may mean for you. It's 
staying fully connected to that four-chambered heart, fully connected and dialed in to awareness. can I stay with myself, with this, my own awakened awareness, my four-chambered heart? And perhaps asking the universe for help, how do I not leave myself on the cushion, in my heart, allowing grace to teach me what I may not see. How do I stay with my open bowl not accepting any offering that doesn't serve me? always waiting for me to plug myself in, no matter how stressful, no matter how trying, no matter how triggering any situation is, the one thing I know I can count on is the onesie of awareness. clothe myself in its clarity, in its openness, in its fullness, in its strength.
so we have some time for questions if anyone has any questions you don't have to put your video on or you can that's completely up to you but if you don't have your video on you'll need to unmute yourself and speak up so that i know you have a question Last time we had so many questions, didn't we, Suzanne? Oh my gosh, we went to like nine, past 9.30, I think. So hopefully everyone's just, I can't see most of you, so hopefully this was enlightening, enjoyable, pondering, whatever you needed it to be for you. Um, I, hope, I hope that it is. Yay, thanks, Sammy. <laughs> I like the thumbs up. It's so interesting teaching to like little squares of names. Um, anyway, so lovely to be with you all. It's 